this session is the start of many sessions that we plan to host um, in regards to a new initiative that the business school is, is going to release basically next week. So I'm, I'm chairing a working group um, that is looking at how we can support better um, businesses during this time of uncertainty. And as part of that, we're going to be running things like seminars, we're going to be offering support in various different ways. Um, and we really want to aim these types of support in regards to engaging with the business community. So if there's anything that you think the business school can do to help you during this time, or you know any topics that you would like covered, then please reach out to myself or any of my colleagues in the business school and we'll be more than happy to take it on board and then embed it into our um, profile of various different supports. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to pass you on to Richard. Um, so Richard is our um, economic expert from the Economic Policy Centre. So over to you, Richard. Okay, thanks, Crystal. So hopefully everything's working and the technology's in place. Um, yeah, I'm just going to kick off here and we'll run through the presentation, as we've said, and then we'll um, pretty much move on to questions and answers at the end. Um, I'm just trying to turn off the camera here to get um, to focus on the, the slides. So we'll stop the video while we're talking. Okay, so thanks all for coming along to the webinar today. So hopefully Ryan and I will be able to provide some insight um, and emerging insight into the economic impact of the COVID-19 restrictions on the NI economy. Um, if you can add your questions in the chat function, we'll certainly do our best to answer them in the end. So, so first of all, as we know, uh, this is a primarily a humanita humanitarian crisis. Um, for an any family that's caught up in this at a personal level, it is incredibly sad. So far, there are about 5.4 million cases globally and 350,000 deaths. So obviously a very significant pandemic and none of us have missed that so far. Of course, there are issues with recording such as those that are in or out of hospital, primary causes of death, comorbidities and challenges of gathering evidence across parts of the developing world. But these are the best current estimates available. So as you can see here from the chart, the US is in a, an invidious position both in terms of confirmed cases and deaths to date. The UK is second, closer to European averages, but again, still in an unenviable position in terms of global lead tables. Um, as you can see here, the island of Ireland is faring slightly better than other parts of the British Isles. Um, we can be thankful that the impact here has been less serious than many initial estimates, and many individuals and families will be grateful for that. So, both north and south, we have a lower and flatter trajectory and suggests that more rapid lockdowns and perhaps more compliant behaviours have reduced the death toll relative to recommended mean. Um, however, until the lines level out for a period of time, um, society isn't out of the woods yet, even with no recorded deaths yesterday, which was a, a very welcome piece of news. Therefore, ongoing restrictions on movement on, and commerce are unfortunately still necessary over the next number of months. If you look at the global economic impact, um, we'll illustrate the routes through which COVID has impacted the economy. So firstly, in terms of containment, the restrictions aimed at reducing the movement of people and resources, and aimed then really to reduce the transmission of virus, the virus through the population. The second part is the disruption to supply chains that were impacted. So enterprises closed or reduced service levels. And even if it was possible to work, you know, trying to socially distance the workforce and pivot employees to work from, work from home has resulted in an initial productivity shock as well. Thirdly, demand has been seriously impacted as consumers have changed their spending habits. Consum consumption makes up about two thirds of the NI economy and therefore reductions in consumption are going to have a serious impact here. Consumers have changed what they purchase, how, and it's also accelerated pre-existing trends towards online shopping. So changes in the level of demand and also the composition. In that. If we look at the global economic impact so far, um, it's clear that the forecasts, as the global forecasting houses uh, come out with their, their publications, as we move forward in time, the, the outlook becomes a bit more gloomy. So it's worth saying that this is a bit of an unusual recession. So it's caused in a, an intentional policy to save lives. That policy pause is, is quite different to what is a normal recession that would happen after a 
maybe a financial market shock because of the end of a war and a reduction in government spending or an oil crisis. You can see here that, as I've said, the, the forecasters are generally downgrading over time. Um, and I suppose when we get to the definitions, it's worth noting that a recession is two consecutive quarters of decline. Um, and we're certainly on track to, to pass that without much of a problem. Um, and then the definition of a depression is a 10% reduction in output from peak to trough. So as you can see from the global forecast, it's a significant enough recession, but not a, not a depression um, in, the, in the global context. Um, if you look at the ILO predictions in terms of jobs, they're predicting about 300 million uh, job losses across the world. And then as um, working hours reduced, they're also predicting about 195 million um, PE equivalents um, removed from the economy as a result of COVID restrictions. So clearly a huge impact across the global economy. If we move now to national forecasts, the most recently published are the Capital Economics publics, published Publications. Sorry. Um, and these are probably one of the more pessimistic sets of forecasts that have come out, but they're one of the most recent. So interestingly, the US, while it's more seriously impacted in terms of cases and deaths, is expected to contract less than other nations as it probably balances its priorities towards um, economic more than healthcare than other nations. The UK itself is in around 12% contraction and Ireland slightly more. So as you can see, capital economics are quite pessimistic in terms of national forecasts for 2020. So these are unprecedented times um, and it has called for, and it has got a very unprecedented policy response. So around the world, if we look at the amount of money that's been allocated to COVID uh, restrictions and responses to keep the economy and life support, until we get through the demand gap. It's been a, a significant policy salvo. So governments really have spared very little in terms of dealing with the crisis. In terms of Europe, the state aid rules have been lifted um, and suspended temporarily as lockdown measures have allowed uh, different, different governments to implement their, their various policies. Fiscal rules in the UK have been suspended as well. Um, so there's no chance of the UK meeting them at all during 2020. So first of all, we've got the immediate fiscal response. So that's government spending. So that's things like medical resources, uh, border scheme, subsidising uh, SMEs and public investment, and then maybe cancelling certain taxes. Um, that basically deteriorates the government's balance sheet, but there's no direct compensation coming back in later on. Governments have also deferred tax payments. So uh, VAT, income tax, national insurance can be paid later. Um, so that helps liquidity in the business community, but it defers uh, income to government in terms of funding and public resources. Um, and then there's all the other liquidity provisions and guarantees. So things like export guarantees, liquidity assistance, et cetera, comes through national development funds. So you can see here that the UK has probably borrowed about 25% of, of GDP so far. Um, so a very, very significant uh, policy intervention in the UK. And here we see, um, impact on public finances. So the UK government borrowed 89 billion during April as spending surged and tax revenues contracted. And that's more than four times what it costs to, spend, to fund all of public services in Northern Ireland for a year. So that gives you a bit of context in terms of how significant um, the increase in spending is. So very clearly, all the, the stops have been pulled out um, and government debt in the UK is moving towards two trillion. So that's currently about um, 28,000 pounds per person. As I said, fiscal targets like borrowing less than 2% of GDP, reducing debt as a proportion of GDP, or maintaining the cap in welfare spending are not going to be close to being met in this year. So in my humble opinion, it's right and correct for the government to borrow and support the private sector during the recession. But in the longer term, it will make it necessary for us to engage in broader societal conversations about what public services we really need and how they can be funded and delivered in the longer term. If we look at what the NI executive has done, it's also launched an unprecedented level of support to trans support enterprises and society until consumer demand returns. The Department of Finance has allocated about 1.2 billion to the COVID-19 response. Um, much of this is already allocated and the remainder of that will be allocated on the basis of bids that will come from the government. Um, so it's not that the money won't be spent, the money will be spent, but it's, it's being allocated on a case-by-case uh, -case basis in terms of society priorities as they come in. So if we now focus more specifically on the NI economy, here's the Ulster Bank's Purchasing Managers Index that's published by Richard Ramsey, um, and it illustrates the NI activity 
fell markedly during April. So um, it's one of the more heavily impacted regions and it's a record low in the series of just 8.3. Um, the way in which you interpret this chart is above 50 is expansion, below 50 is contraction, and 50 is stability. So when we get a result of 8.3, there's a significant contraction in that month in the economy. So unfortunately, um, we were reporting record highs in employment and record lows in unemployment in the months leading up to the, the COVID-19 pandemic. And that was driving wage growth across the economy. But now we're looking at the, the sharpest contraction in our history. So this in turn will hit markets across Northern Ireland. Here we have the business impact of COVID-19 survey, which is published by the ONS. Now I will just say that we need to be careful with survey data because it does rely on small sample sizes. So here we have just 214 responses for Northern Ireland. So unfortunately, the official data are pretty lagged in Northern Ireland. Um, we're relying on surveys from a range of areas and partial perspectives to try and establish the overall economic impact. But if you put all of that together, we can roughly get an idea of what's happening. What this shows is about three quarters of firms have furloughed staff, two and five are deferring tax payments, and a third have received a rates holiday so far. The proportion not applying for any support has also fallen. That was something that I was surprised about in earlier surveys from ONS um, because Northern Ireland seemed to be more heavily impacted but had fewer uh, businesses applying for support. So I thought that was uh, a bit odd, but that's maybe rectifying itself now. You should also be aware of the public sector, which makes up about a quarter of the economy, and that's still working. So perhaps they're working in a different location, but for the most part, um, several in public servants are, are, are still working. Um, I know there's some conversations about certain uh, people or occupations being followed. Um, now to move on to looking at those who are not working. So this chart replicates CSO analysis that was carried out for Ireland um, and looks at the UK, Ireland, and NI. So what it shows is a pretty similar picture across the, the three areas. Um, and that is that almost about a third of employees are either unemployed or on the furlough uh, scheme at the moment, the coronavirus job retention scheme. Again, that is a scheme without precedent. Um, its objective is to keep unemployment much lower than it would otherwise have been. Um, it tries to keep employees with employers and should avoid the cost of rehiring um, if those employees are requiring a longer term. Its impact, again, is concentrated in lower paying sectors because they're the most heavily impacted. We'll talk about that a bit later, um, and it does support individual and household income. Here we can see in claimant count a very sharp vertical incline in unemployment claimants in April. So it increased the rate from 2.4%, which was close to a record low, up to 6%. So unfortunately, we're back to levels last seen in the Great Recession, or sorry, last seen in the 1998 recession, um, and around the 1998 Good Friday Agreement. So we sort of moved back in time quite quickly in terms of unemployment, and there will be um, unfortunately a bit more to come over recent months or future months than that. If you look at universal credit, um, this is a chart that's quite difficult to work out any trend because there was a movement of uh, individuals from other uh, forms of support onto universal credit, so we can't really work out a time series in this. But what you can see is the just the break in trajectory as universal claimants uh, increased as COVID hit the CNI economy. Hi, Richard. I just, want to, I just want to interrupt you two seconds. I think your volume's dipping in and out a bit. Um, is it? I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. We can still hear you, um, but it dips a bit. Okay, I'll try to keep closer to the microphone. Um, and closer in terms of universal credit, then, um, what we see here is that a bit of a local government perspective. So urban areas, manufacturing areas, and tourism areas have all been significantly impacted. Um, those areas in the commuter belt or with a large proportion of farming, so public sector, commuting, and farming, probably less impacted in general, but a significant increase um, in around the sort of urban areas and manufacturing and tourism um, elements of the economy. If you take a range of forecasts that have been published for Northern Ireland so far, um, these range from minus 6.7 to minus 10% for NI. So these are four forecasts from uh, four houses across Northern Ireland, including EPC. So it's, it's expected to be a significant and deep recession during 2020. Um, so much more, uh, much more rapid and a bit deeper than 2008. The 2008 recession took effectively five quarters to unfold. 
um, and the impact really the recovery has taken sort of five years in some indicators and say almost a decade in terms of other indicators like real uh, GBs as well. So then we looked at how we would support the most vulnerable in society. So working out who are the most vulnerable is, is one of the areas that we've been looking at within the Economic Policy Centre. So my colleagues Mark McGill and Margaret McPeak are working on a, a piece that will look at the characteristics of those that are furloughed or unemployed. Um, and that will publish then hopefully in a, another couple of weeks. So there's, there's quite a lot of work going on within the centre around the impacts of COVID and how we design policy and responses then um, in terms of what, how, and, how and what and why and when we support individuals back into employment um, or through that journey. Um, from being outside employment and getting back into sort of um, gainful employment. Ryan and I have been working on a slightly different perspective. So this models the potential impact of the restrictions in society. So, you know, what you're going to see here is uh, very much due to a lot of the hard work that Ryan's done. Um, but like most recessions, I think those who are already quite vulnerable or in precarious employment situations in an economic sense are quite likely to be the most impacted. Um, our analysis suggests that this will be the same for, for Northern Ireland too. So those are the areas that policy will need to support. So if we look at basically how the model was built, um, we looked at 370 or so very detailed occupations. Um, and we looked to see whether or not those people would be exposed in their, to the virus in their day-to-day -day employment, whether they were able to socially distance and by how, how much demand for their services could potentially have changed. These are then aggregated from what is called four digit, those 370 odd sectors or occupations, um, up to sort of more aggregated sectors. And this is the, the summation of a lot of that analysis. So, what you can see here is that some occupations are going to be significantly impacted by social distancing, so the light blue at the bottom of the bar, um, and those others through demand gaps, like sales occupations, um, are significantly impacted demand gaps rather than social distancing. So there's different reasons and different driving factors as to why um, people may be vulnerable and other employment may be, may be vulnerable. So if you look at the vulnerable jobs by sector, um, you can see here there's no surprises in this in terms of what we have we've been looking at in recent figures, so wholesale and resale, retail trade, manufacturing, restaurants and hotels, construction, service and admin, transport and storage. Those are all the things that are impacted um, by quite a bit. Retailing in particular has seen pre-existing trends accelerate and the move to online purchasing at scale um, might change behave consumer behaviours to the point where the retail market changes significantly during and after the, the recession. If you look at the full-time part-time split here, you can see you know there's quite a lot of part-time workers in sales and uh, administration. So those Part-time workers are um, more likely to become vulnerable um, than the full-time workers. So that's the, the composition. Overall, there are more full-time workers that are vulnerable because there are more full-time workers in the economy. Um, but if you're uh, in a low-qualified, low-paid uh, sales occupation job, or um, those are the types of occupations that are generally slightly more uh, at risk from the recession. In terms of looking at the picture by geography, again, the manufacturing and tourism focused areas are most at risk with the greatest share of employment in the vulnerable categories. So areas like Mid-Ulster, Causeway, Coast and Glens, Bidney, Stantrum. So um, Mid-Ulster and Bidney, Stantrum, ABC, all quite focused on manufacturing, Causeway, Coast and Glens and Fermanagh and Oma um, on tourism as well. So those are areas that are um, slightly more vulnerable. Those with significant amounts of public administration, health, education, or agriculture are more insulated, but what we can see is a pretty similar picture across Northern Ireland. When we look at um, occupations by salary, um, those who are most vulnerable are generally in the lowest uh, paid forms of employment. So that corresponds again to lower formal qualification levels um, who are generally most vulnerable. So even before the recession, unemployment rates below those, um, those who are lowest qualified um, we're already higher, and this trend is likely to be exacerbated by the recession, unfortunately. Therefore, the policy framework to help support individuals back to work and into work will be much more important in the, the coming months and years. Male-female perspective is interesting. Um, so, again, it really depends on what occupations are predominantly female and which are predominantly held by, by male 
post holders. So if you look at say manufacturing construction here, um, it's a broadly uh, male occupation um, and, and therefore it's mostly males that are affected. There are predominantly more females in things like sales occupations and therefore again the impact is, is larger for females. Healthcare is something that's not on the chart and this is where some demand will increase employment. Um, and that increase in employment then is expected to drive some demand for female labour. So broadly, we would see it as roughly a 60-40 split in favour of female workers. Um, if we move on to youth unemployment, this is a, an indicator here that we really should be keeping a very close eye on. So we should watch this indicator closely over the next number of months. In June, um, we have a, a significant number of children leaving school um, for their education and university. So this indicator is something that I would worry about in coming months. Um, it's been under 10,000 for quite a, quite a while now, and this is 16 to 24 year olds who are un in unemployment. But it could easily rise by 5,000 or more in the near future as access to employment opportunities decline, and the ability to emigrate, um, as happened in the last recession, particularly from Ireland to areas like Australia, New Zealand, and Canada, um, decline given the, the COVID restrictions. and and all that sort of stuff. So that's us through the bad news. Um, it's not all bad news, there are glimmers of hope. Um, some indicators are beginning to rebound and we're looking at the data to see if whether or not the economy is going in the right way. Um, there is a recovery plan with or without dates, but it begins to establish a framework for returning to work. So industries are beginning to adjust. Um, they're starting to recreate what might be the new normal. So. This is a UK-wide survey, and almost a fifth of restaurants and hotels have restarted trading. Now, albeit that's in a very different form to what we knew um, before the crisis. Um, obviously, the restaurants are doing sort of takeaway moves and that sort of stuff, and margins would be eroded, productivity will be down, um, and survival will be a, quite a bit tougher for a number of those, uh, those, those businesses. Um, construction, manufacturing and wholesale and retail, um, a lot of them beginning to return to work. So you can see here that there is a, a trend back towards work um, and even our colleagues in Invest and I are, are reporting that a number of uh, employees in Invest and I companies are beginning to get back to work as well. So it's a good sign. In terms of the PMI, um, it wasn't very widely reported but the UK Composite Index was less bad. Um, than the, uh, during May than April. So there's a bit of a rebound there. It still represents contraction, but the contraction uh, during this month is a slightly less position. If you look at traffic rates, you can see here that during the initial stages of the lockdown, um, traffic uh, got down to about say 28 to 30% of what it was uh, at a pre-lockdown level. Um, now back up to around 80%, a lot of that might be leisure based or um, people getting out of their houses just to, to change the scenery. But traffic rates, and you can see it on the road, that the, the travel around Northern Ireland is definitely beginning to tick up. In terms of shipping, an area that I have a particular interest in, it's a good leading indicator. You can see here really that um, from just over 200 visits a week to Northern Ireland to about um, just over 100, between 100 and 150. So that's the, the total for Warren Point, Larne and Belfast, it doesn't include all the ports. Um, but what you can see here, there's a bit of a plateau as things stabilise then after the initial demand reduction. And over the last couple of weeks, we have seen an uptick um, in shipping visits to Northern Ireland. So that's a good leading indicator as people begin to buy things that may come in from other parts of the world or even in the export as well. So demand for things like um, peat and stuff, so exporting those sorts of things have been good for the local economy. The question of whether or not we're ready to restart the economy is something that we're focusing on. So again, we've we've recorded no uh, deaths over the last over, over one single day. So hopefully that trend will continue. Um, there's low virus spread at the minute. Hopefully that reduces to, to zero and begins to peter out. The question is whether the economic system then is, is ready to, to get back into gear. So whilst the healthcare situation is better and less severe than initial estimates, we do believe that it's going to take some time to emerge from the crisis um, and potentially a number of years to recover lost economic ground. So I think here there's cause for cautious optimism in terms of how we, we begin to recover and begin to get people back to work and back 
the sum normality. So in terms of the summary and roundup, um, what we've witnessed so far is the spread of the COVID, COVID pandemic across the world. 350,000 deaths so far. So obviously it's a, a terrible and very serious health emergency. So very sad for anybody that's actually been caught up on that on a personal level. Unlike any other restriction, um, government policy has restricted movement and trade in order to reduce the transmission and save lives. So that has resulted in a global recession. Perhaps the lockdown policy responses could have been more rapid and saved more lives, but the economic life support measures um, have been rapid and pretty broad ranging, providing a lifeline to many tens of individuals. In Northern Ireland, it's a deep and rapid recession. So this is a, what we're seeing here is something that is, is quite severe. So 2008, as I've said, took five quarters to unfold, and this took a few weeks. With forecasts of, say, minus six to minus 9%, um, over 2020, we do hope that the policy responses and return to some form of um, activity will aid the recovery. But there are vulnerable groups. So the young, those with low levels of formal qualification, those in lower income groups, and those especially who are not um, digitally enabled, are all more vulnerable during the recession and the recovery. So as a society, I think we'll need to ensure that limited resources are now targeted at the groups that need support most. So the time has probably passed for those blanket policy supports. Um, as we gather better economic intelligence, we survey in full across Northern Ireland, and better official data emerges, then we can begin to build much more tailored policy interventions um, and design and implement those. So what we must absolutely avoid is um, thousands of young people joining the unemployment register and remaining there for any longer than is absolutely necessary. If we look to the future, there are certainly glimmers of hope as sectors reignite. Um, a range of sectors have showed some upturns in, in activity, um, and there are also sectors that continue to work. So the, the good thing here is that 70% of jobs aren't necessarily vulnerable. We have the public sector, education, healthcare, agriculture, and lesser um, logistics to a lesser degree. Um, it might seem very obvious to say that the future is going to be different, and I think it will be um, quite different after the recession. So consumer behaviours have already changed, existing trends have accelerated, um, and the post-recession NI will be quite different. So in terms of automation, online purchasing, robots that don't require social distancing, um, and the faster automation in society, of society is probably a consequence of the recession, and also a strand of the, the recovery strategy. Individuals are saving and paying down debt for at least a while, um, as uncertainty prevails for many. We're, almost, we're also a bit more environmentally aware, um, and the impact on congestion and poor air quality are significant costs in society, um, negative externalities, as us economists call them. So working from home is likely to become more prevalent, and that's going to put a lot more pressure on our technological infrastructure rather than our physical infrastructure. Um, public finances have seen a significant shock, and I think we can expect conversations about how society raises our money to fund public services. Um, and what public services uh, we really do need most. Other things like um, levelling up uh, at a sub-regional level, so there's a good opportunity here for some of the sub-regions that have been perhaps lagging behind uh, core business districts to try and catch up as people work from home. And that's a bit of a redistribution across the economy. But I think generally, um, behaviourally, we have reframed what our work life and home life are some will want to go back and some won't, um, but many of us now realise what our automatic, automatic decision making and automatic lives were before the crisis as we sort of rushed from one task to the next and um, tried to, to keep all the, the plates spinning in the air. Um, and that time has been freed up for activity. So it may not seem like it now, um, but given all the bad news we've seen in there, there's a lot to do. Um, economic policy is going to be very important over the next five to ten years. Um, but all crises do come to an end. The 2008 um, crisis came to an end, and this one will too. So in terms of future conversations, we have a few ideas. We're, we're building short-range forecasts, looking at the economy and labour market out to 2020 and 21. Um, we're also working with a range of um, departments, NDPBs and councils, in terms of future policy frameworks and how we emerge and regrow the economy. And then also one of the things that's going to be really important is how we position our competitiveness um, and how we build productivity over the, the longer term because all of our competitor nations are going to be trying to compete for what might be a smaller pool of FDI and Northern Ireland is really going to have to put its next its best foot forward over the next number of years. 
But as Crystal said, you know, we have some ideas about the next few COVID conversations. Um, we'd welcome your engagement and your ideas about what topics are important to you. So thanks for listening. Thanks to Ryan for all his hard work on this. And please do get in touch if you have any questions that are not answered or discussed here today. So thank you. I'll hand back to Crystal. Okay, thank you very much, Richard. Um, we have a few questions in the chat and I had one that was sent in advance. So in total, that's about four questions. I know we're, we're, we'd only promised to take up 30 minutes. So I think if we answer these four and then if there's any other questions, as you said, different topics, because I think today you know, you've covered quite a lot, which, is, which has been great and given us a really good overview. Um, but as you mentioned, we can delve deeper into different themes. Um, on the different seminar series that we're going to be promoting. I'll just read out the first question and then I'll go to the questions in the chat. So the first question that was sent in um, said, I haven't been to Belfast City in over two months and imagine others have had a similar experience. Many employees formerly based in the city and their employers have rapidly adopted technology and found that it works for them. How high would you rate the prospect that many of this workforce will not return to Belfast in the same numbers or with the same frequency? And are you worried about the implications of that for the economy of our largest city and the wider economy, particularly the retail and hospitality sectors? So there's quite a lot in that, but I think it's quite yeah. an interesting one. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. Absolutely um, on a, a range of topics, including automation, submission, distribution, all of that sort of stuff. So, I think from an employee's perspective, first of all, you know, they're going to weigh up the risks of whether or not they can socially distance and how they're going to return to work. So even how they travel to work, will they travel in public transport? Um, are they able to socially distance? And are they going to, say, resort to traveling in their own car, walking or, or cycling? Um, so change behaviors there in terms of how we get to work firstly um, and sort of the risk behavior of employees. Um, the construction of offices and social distancing is something that's going to be a challenge. So stairways, lifts, facilities, all of those sorts of things. Um, but I think a range of employers potentially could see this as an opportunity to reduce costs, increase competitiveness. So it could become a bit more um, lean and mean in terms of the future. If, if we're working from home, um, I think that's a, a potential opportunity for some employers. Um, the technological infrastructure, as I've said, is very important here. So we're quite well fibre enabled in Northern Ireland um, and it's one of our uh, key competitiveness strengths. And I think the focus will move from physical infrastructure to technological infrastructure in terms of priorities for government spending over the next while. So ensuring that people can work from home. The opportunity there is for a lot of the sub-regions to level up. So we've heard a lot about levelling up across the UK. Um, it was one of the public service agreement targets going back into the sort of early 2000s. And it really has come back onto the, the policy agenda with the, the north of England and all of that sort of stuff in the post-Brexit world as well. Um, there are opportunities there, of course, for some of the sub-regions as people work at home and perhaps spend more time and money in the local areas. Um, but as you said in the question, you know, there are challenges there for um, certainly the, the sort of city centre economy in terms of, say, coffee shops or small retail, which will be impacted if there are fewer people um, working in the city centre. Um, buying lunches, buying coffees and all that sort of thing. So I think, you know, what emerges after the recession um, is going to be a different structure to what we knew beforehand. Um, and that's, that's the nature of recessions, um, unfortunately. So um, there will be opportunities for people in there and there will be significant challenges. But unfortunately, I don't think um, all, all of the enterprises will weather the storm. Um, we have a question here from Robert Fitzpatrick, um, who's interested to know what you think will happen to businesses where social distancing is not economically feasible. Yeah, um, well, if it's not economically feasible, I suppose it becomes a significant challenge then for that, uh, that business in terms of how it delivers its service. Um, it's a different business model. There's a question of whether or not they can engage in automation. So are there machines, robots, or um, that can be employed, are there different methods in terms of getting people to work from home? But really that's a question of whether or not the business itself can pivot, um, change how it operates and change its operating model. Um, obviously a lot of manufacturing, um, logistics, uh, all of those sorts of things aren't, just can't be carried out in a remote working environment. So again, uh, 
if social distancing is a significant challenging, automation offers a potential solution there. So that's something that Northern Ireland has probably lagged with over the last number of years. Um, there's not a, a high level of sort of capital investment in automated technologies. Um, and also there's not very good data on this either. So it's something that we've, we've researched in the past. So yeah, I think it's gonna be challenging for those companies, but um, changes will be absolutely necessary in terms of survival, in terms of and, and pivoting to, to look at what the, the new world and the new normal looks like. Chris, you're dipping in and out a wee bit again, maybe just for me, I'm not sure right. if it's for everyone. Um, we do have another question um, from Richard Kirk. I'm not sure if Richard, do you want to read it out loud? Um, um, yes, can... sure. Oh, great. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, yeah. no, Richard. Hi, Richard. Thanks very much for that. I really appreciate that, that overview. I, I suppose the, uh, I really picked up on the slide. You, you seem to be uh, drawing our attention to that youth unemployment slide. And um, it sounded like there was a lot of concern in your voice. Um, what, what sort of government policies do you see emerging um, from that evidence that you've presented there that might help address it? Well, I think here we have to look at opportunities. So um, for those individuals that may not be able to get into their first job, I think we should be looking at other education opportunities. So whether that's through formal education, informal education, training, apprenticeships, all of those routes need to be explored. It's much better to have those individuals in some form of training or um, sort of improvement in their skills and qualifications, whether formal or informal, um, that they're better able then to enter the labour market as, as the recovery does progress. So there will be a recovery. Um, and for us, it's a lot of it's about ensuring that they have the right skills, aptitude and knowledge to get into those jobs when they do emerge. One thing that I do think will be different is the level of automation and digitization across the economy. So there's a bit of a, a shunt forward here of existing trends, maybe by say three to five years, certainly, and maybe more in some instances. So again, those digitally enabled um, types of skills, uh, STEM skills, ensuring that people can get into work in what will be a more digitally enabled environment, I think is very, very important. So conversion courses, um, apprenticeships, all forms of training certainly would be better than, than unemployment for a year. Um, and as I said, the ability to uh, emigrate has been almost removed because a lot of people in 2008 did go to Australia to work in the construction industry, work in mines, all that sort of stuff. Um, and that's an option now that is, is um, less, much less available than it was at that point in time. Equally in, in mines in Australia, a lot of that technology now is automated, the trucks. So, you know, we've got automation now replacing some of the tasks that an individual would have carried out in the past. Um, I should also say here that automation, I don't see it as a, as a completely destructive threat. I see it as threats and opportunities um, where tasks are eroded and other tasks are done by humans, but it allows time and screwing up then to, to focus on other things that are going to require more human touch. So yeah, I am concerned about youth unemployment. I do think there's um, a lot of um, policy challenge coming around the corner, uh, but even things like Mazen caps for universities, if we are um, potentially taking in fewer international students, then you know we should be able hopefully to take in uh, more local students as well. So whether or not students are gonna be willing to travel to universities in GB from Northern Ireland um, or Ireland, um, and whether then international students, how long that's going to take for the international students to come back into Northern Ireland. So again, that looks at cash flows for universities, which is obviously important at this point in time as well. Um, but a lot of it will be diversion from existing um, customers to, to new customers as well. So hopefully that answers your question, Richard. And I think that's, that's absolutely one of the things we should be focusing on quite a bit in the next number of years. That's great. Thank you, Richard. Okay, great. So we've got another question. Um, this is from Stephen Kelly. So Stephen, if you want to ask your question. Thanks, Crystal and Richard. Thanks very much for the presentation this morning. It's exceptionally useful, uh, if bleak in parts. Uh, you, you talk about a focus from a policy response on vulnerable groups, but have you any view on the potential policy response required for vulnerable sectors or indeed those kind of sub-regional areas where this COVID impact is going to be more pronounced? Yeah, um, if it's something I didn't cover just because of, of time really here today, but if you look at the business surveys, 
um, Northern Ireland enterprises generally have a lower level of resilience. So they've, they have a lower level of um, free cash flow and they have lower amounts of money left to, to rise over the next number of months. So the proportion that have one, two or three months of, of money left for survival is a higher um, in Northern Ireland than other parts of the UK. So certainly there's a, there's a bigger vulnerable business question here to be answered in Northern Ireland um, than there are in other parts of the UK. It's difficult, I suppose, to tailor maybe all the solutions like on a sector by sector basis. Um, and so far, it's been blanket supports and blanket um, policies. So the likes of the coronavirus job retention scheme, the C bills, large C bills, all of that sort of stuff. Um, and those are those are pretty broad ranging. Again, if you look at the construction of a lot of the policies, because they were fast um, and rapid in terms of deployment, there are gaps there, and people do fall through those cracks. Certain businesses fall through the, the cracks in the policy framework. Um, the the um, hardship fund that's just been announced by DFAMB uh, Invest and I does attempt to deal with some of that, but again, I'm aware that micro businesses below nine employees are, are another gap that isn't necessarily covered. So again, as we move through this, we keep analysing the data. We look at who's vulnerable, which businesses are vulnerable, which individuals, um, and look at viability then in the longer term to try and make sure that those that can survive do survive, and if it is a demand gap that you know, government can support through that demand gap. If it is a, an issue with socially distancing, that there's support available to help construct a socially distanced environment um, or free and your screens that certainly companies get the support that they need. But again, I think one of the things here that we do struggle with is the lack of evidence. Um, and we have a lot of different surveys with not very much official evidence um, just at that point in time because of how quickly it's unfolded. Um, so I think, yeah, you're absolutely right. There are vulnerable businesses and sectors, and as we get better information, that's certainly something that we'll be engaging with DFE and Invest and I on um, as they look at their recovery plan. But you can be assured that there's there's lots of work, there's lots of conversations, and, and very very busy people in those organisations um, trying to identify those that are in need um, and design the support mechanisms that, that might help. So, thanks. That's a that's a good question, Stephen. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Uh, we just have one last question because I'm very aware we've taken up a lot of people's time, um, but I don't want to leave Norman out. So we have one last question from Norman Kagan. Norman, if you want to maybe read out your question. Um, so Norman had asked in the chat, um, you mentioned low virus spread. Um, how is this measured with limited tracking or testing and tracking? Um, I think that's only a bit of a healthcare um, topic. So it's, again, that's probably not something that I'd be that well qualified to answer. Um, so if, if you don't mind, maybe we'll, we'll leave that question. Um, it's, again, I think one of the healthcare experts in the university maybe would be a better place to answer that. So Crystal, I'm happy enough to try and get an answer and get that back to him in writing if we can. Yeah, no, that's no problem. No, that's great. No, well, that's brilliant. That really wraps up all our questions. Um, I suppose we just want to, yeah, leave it again just to emphasize that this is just, you know, the start of um, a number of seminars that we are going to host over June and over the summer. As I said, there's a number of different supports. Um, so I chair a business support group um, and the supports that we're going to be offering is going to be communicated very soon. Um, but we really wanted to be responsive to individuals needs. So if there's anything at all that the business club can help you with or any topics or, you know, anything that you think um, that we can do to um, help in any way, please do get in touch uh, because we're really open for, you know, helping in any way at the minute. We're open you know, for ideas to be creative in this time um, and I suppose everyone pulling together. So I really want to thank you all again for coming. Um, this recording will be made available online for anyone who wants to look back. Um, and as I said, if anyone wants to reach out, then don't hesitate. Thank you.